This is a summary of A Course in Miracles, Chapter 21, Reason and Perception. Introduction Projection makes perception. The world you see is what you gave it, nothing more than that. Therefore, to you, it is important. It is the witness to your state of mind, the outside picture of an inward condition. Perception is a result and not a cause, and that is why order of difficulty in miracles is meaningless. Everything looked upon with vision is healed and holy. The world you see but shows you how much joy you have allowed yourself to see in you and to accept as yours. And, if this is its meaning, then the power to give it joy must lie within you. In summary, the introduction is saying, we are responsible for what we see and how we respond emotionally to it. Our world bears witness to our inner state of mind, and therefore we have the power to change the world through changing our minds. Let us see it forgiven and make peace with all our relationships and it will change accordingly. We can do this with all things and anything. There is no order of difficulty in miracles. Section 1. The Forgotten Song Never forget, the world the sightless see must be imagined, for what it really looks like is unknown to them. And so it is with you. You do not see. Your cues for inference are wrong, and so you stumble and fall down upon the stones you did not recognize, but fail to be aware you can go through the doors you thought were closed, but which stand open before unseeing eyes, waiting to welcome you. How foolish is it to attempt to judge what could be seen instead? It is not necessary to imagine what the world must look like. It must be seen before you recognize it for what it is. There is no need to learn through pain, and gentle lessons are acquired joyously and are remembered gladly. You are not a happy learner yet because you still remain uncertain that vision gives you more than judgment does, and you have learned that both you cannot have. The blind become accustomed to their world by their adjustments to it. They learned it, not through joyous lessons, but through the stern necessity of limits they believed they could not overcome. Thus they define their life and where they live, adjusting to it as they think they must, afraid to lose the little that they have. And so it is with all who see the body as all they have and all their brothers have. Listen, perhaps you can catch a hint of an ancient state not quite forgotten, dim perhaps, and yet not altogether unfamiliar, like a song whose name is long forgotten and the circumstances in which you heard completely unremembered. Not the whole song has stayed with you, but just a little wisp of melody, attached not to a person or a place or anything particular. But you remember, from just this little part, how lovely was the song, how wonderful the setting where you heard it, and how you loved those who were there and listened with you. Listen. And see if you remember an ancient song you knew so long ago and held more dear than any melody you taught yourself to cherish since. Beyond the body, beyond the sun and stars, past everything you see and yet somehow familiar, is an arc of golden light that stretches as you look into a great and shining circle. And all the circle fills with light before your eyes. The light expands and covers everything, extending to infinity, forever shining and with no break or limit anywhere. Within it, everything is joined in perfect continuity. 
nor is it possible to imagine that anything could be outside, for there is nowhere that this light is not. This is the vision of the Son of God, whom you know well. Accept the vision that can show you this, and not the body. And now the blind can see, for that same song they sing in honor of their Creator gives praise to them as well. The blindness that they made will not withstand the memory of this song, and they will look upon the vision of the Son of God, remembering who He is they sing of. What is a miracle but this remembering? The light in one awakens it in all, and when you see it in your brother, you are remembering for everyone. In summary, section one, the forgotten song, is saying, the forgotten song is the forgotten world we once could see with our spirit eyes. We have forgotten what the world looks like without the ego's impression upon our mind, clouding our vision. We look out on the world and each other and think what we are seeing is the truth of our reality. But in fact, we are blind to the light within all. So we adjust to what we think we see and live according to what we understand to be the truth, though nothing could be further from it. We have forgotten the song of truth, but not entirely. The fact we are searching for truth at all is a clear sign we remember a small refrain from this forgotten song. We know it is there. We search for the light within all living things. Let our minds accept this light and imagine it expanding, replacing the world we see through our ego's eyes. This light is our truth, not the body. This is the vision of the Son of God, through which all are included in the symphony of the long-forgotten song, and the miracle of remembering is welcomed. Section 2 the responsibility for sight. We have repeated how little is asked of you to learn this course. It is the same small willingness you need to have your whole relationship transformed to joy, the little gift you offer to the Holy Spirit for which he gives you everything, the very little on which salvation rests, the tiny change of mind by which the crucifixion is changed to resurrection. This is the only thing that you need do for vision, happiness, release from pain, and the complete escape from sin, all to be given you. Say only this, but mean it with no reservations, for here the power of salvation lies. I am responsible for what I see. I choose the feelings I experience, and I decide upon the goal I would achieve and everything that seems to happen to me I ask for and receive as I have asked. Deceive yourself no longer that you are helpless in the face of what is done to you. Acknowledge but that you have been mistaken, and all effects of your mistakes will disappear. No accident nor chance is possible within the universe as God created it, outside of which is nothing. Suffer, and you decided sin was your goal. Be happy, and you gave the power of decision to him who must decide for God for you. This is the little gift you offer to the Holy Spirit, and even this he gives to you to give yourself. For by this gift is given you the power to release your Savior, that he may give salvation unto you. Begrudge not, then, this little offering. Withhold it, and you keep the world as now you see it. Give it away, and everything you see goes with it. Perhaps you do not see the need for you to give this little offering. Look closer, then, at what it is, and, very simply, see in it the whole exchange of separation for salvation. The Holy Spirit can give you faith in holiness 
and vision to see it easily enough. All you are asked to do is let it in, only to stop your interference with what will happen of itself, simply to recognize again the presence of what you thought you gave away. Be willing, for an instant, to leave your altars free of what you placed upon them, and what is really there you cannot fail to see. What you desire you will see, and if its reality is false, you will uphold it by not realizing all the adjustments you have introduced to make it so. It is as needful that you recognize you made the world you see, as that you recognize that you did not create yourself. They are the same mistake. Yet the truth is, you and your brother were both created by a loving Father who created you together as one. See what proves otherwise, and you deny your whole reality. This is the same mistake as thinking you are independent of the source by which you were created and have never left. In summary, Section 2, The Responsibility for Sight, is saying, We are responsible for our own way of seeing. We must choose between the ego and the Holy Spirit's vision. This is our one responsibility because our whole reality depends on what we choose. We cannot see two realities at once. How much willingness does it take to decide to see beyond the body, knowing it is not who we are? Just a small amount of effort, simply the inner recognition of our oneness as we look upon ourselves, is enough. If we can learn to recognize our mistake in seeing, our ego is undone, and a new world will be revealed to us. Clear your altar through the desire to see beyond that which is now presented to you by your ego, and you will have taken responsibility for your sight. <clears throat> Section 3. Faith, Belief, and Vision all special relationships have sin as their goal, for they are bargains with reality, toward which the seeming union is adjusted. And that is why the Holy Spirit must change its purpose to make it useful to Him and harmless to you. If you accept this change, you have accepted the idea of making room for truth. The source of sin is gone. You may imagine that you will still experience its effects, but it is not your purpose, and you no longer want it. The power of faith is never recognized if it is placed in sin, but it is always recognized if it is placed in love. Why is it strange to you that faith can move mountains? This is indeed a little feat for such a power. Faith and belief and vision are the means by which the goal of holiness is reached. Through them, the Holy Spirit leads you to the real world and away from all illusions where your faith was laid. His faith and his belief and vision are all for you, and when you have accepted them completely instead of yours, you will have need of them no longer. For faith and vision and belief are meaningful only before the state of certainty is reached. In heaven they are unknown, yet heaven is reached through them. The Holy Spirit has a use for all the means for sin by which you sought to find it, but as he uses them, they lead away from sin because his purpose lies in the opposite direction. You made perception that you might choose among your brothers and seek for sin with them. The Holy Spirit sees perception as a means to teach you that the vision of a holy relationship is all you want to see. Then will you give your faith to holiness, desiring and believing in it because of your desire. Faith and belief become attached to vision as all the means that once served sin are redirected now toward holiness. 
those who would free their brothers from the body can have no fear. They have renounced the means for sin by choosing to let all limitations be removed. As they desire to look upon their brothers in holiness, the power of their belief and faith sees far beyond the body, supporting vision, not obstructing it. For all who choose to look away from sin are given vision and are led to holiness. Join your awareness to what has already been joined. The body was made to be a sacrifice to sin, and in the darkness so it still is seen. Yet in the light of vision it is looked upon quite differently. You can have faith in it to serve the Holy Spirit's goal and give it power to serve as means to help the blind to see. But in their seeing they look past it, as do you. You gave perception and belief and faith from mind to body. Let them now be given back to what produced them and use them still to save itself from what it made. In summary, section 3, Faith, Belief, and Vision, is saying, All special relationships, though they seem to be the joining of two people, are actually relationships based upon separation. This is because all special relationships are based upon the body, what it looks like, and the impressive things the occupant of said body can achieve with it. Such bodily attractions are the whole attraction of sin, or separation. It is not wrong to love certain points about another, but it is a mistake in thinking it is solely who they truly are. We bargain with the reality of our union when we see them as anything other than one with all that is. We must have faith in this truth and believe in what lies beyond the body. For faith and belief lead to true vision of the truth of our holy, unified relationship with everyone around us. Faith, belief, and vision will ultimately save us from the separation we think we live in now. Section 4. The Fear to Look Within The Holy Spirit will never teach you that you are sinful. Errors he will correct, but this makes no one fearful. You are indeed afraid to look within and see the sin you think is there. Loudly, the ego tells you not to look inward, for if you do, your eyes will light on sin, and God will strike you blind. This you believe, and so you do not look. What if you looked within and saw no sin? This fearful question is the one the ego never asks, and you who ask it now are threatening the ego's whole defensive system too seriously for it to bother to pretend it is your friend not wholly mad. You have been willing to look on much of your insanity and recognize its madness. Your faith is moving inward, past insanity, and on to reason. The Holy Spirit's purpose was accepted by the part of your mind the egos know not of. This part has seen your brother and recognized him perfectly since time began and it desired nothing but to join with him and to be free again as it once was. And now the ego is afraid, yet what it hears in terror, the other part hears as the sweetest music, the song it longed to hear since first the ego came into your mind. The ego's weakness is its strength. Look gently on your brother, and remember the ego's weakness is revealed in both your sight. What it would keep apart has met and joined, and looks upon the ego unafraid. The quiet way is open. Follow it happily, and question not what must be so. In summary, section 4, The Fear to Look Within is saying, the ego's weakness is seeing separation, while our strength lies in the truth of our union in God. Where the ego crumbles in pain over losses in this world, 
the Holy Spirit within us, remain strong in knowing we can never lose any living thing, for all remain part of the whole for eternity. The ego believes that if we look within, all we will see is emptiness and loss. Yet what if all we saw was wholeness, peace, and contentment? We are now not so insane that we cannot look. There is a part of our mind that still remembers the truth and desires nothing more than to rejoin with that which is whole. To want to see only our oneness is nothing but the sweetest music to our inner self. Do not fear to look within and see this light, for what the ego would have you believe is separate has been joined since the beginning of time and does not fear anything the ego believes. Section 5. The Function of Reason Perception selects and makes the world you see. It literally picks it out as the mind directs. For what you would look for, you are far more likely to discover than what you would prefer to overlook. Perception is a choice and not a fact. But on this choice depends far more than you may realize as yet. For on the voice you choose to hear, and on the sights you choose to see, depends entirely your whole belief in what you are. Reality needs no cooperation from you to be itself, but your awareness of it needs your help, because it is your choice. Listen to what the ego says, and see what it directs you see, and it is sure that you will see yourself as tiny, vulnerable, and afraid. You will, you will believe that you are helpless prey to forces far beyond your own control and far more powerful than you. There is another vision and another voice in which your freedom lies, awaiting but your choice. And if you place your faith in them, you will perceive another self in you. This other self sees miracles as natural. You do not realize the whole extent to which the idea of separation has interfered with reason. Reason lies in the other self you have cut off from your awareness and nothing you have allowed to stay in your awareness is capable of reason. God's plan for your salvation could not have been established without your will and your consent. Therefore, what joined the will of God must be in you now, being eternal. You must have set aside a place in which the Holy Spirit can abide and where he is. Such would your reason tell you if you listened. Yet such is clearly not the ego's reasoning. It is not meaningful to ask if what must be is so, but it is meaningful to ask why you are unaware of what is so, for this must have an answer if the plan of God for your salvation is complete. Where would the answer be but in the source? And where are you but there, where this same answer is. Oh yes, you know this, and more than this alone. Faith and perception and belief can be misplaced and serve the great deceiver's needs as well as truth. But reason has no place at all in madness, nor can it be adjusted to fit its end. For the perception would fall away at once, if reason were applied. The part of your mind where reason lies was dedicated by your will in union with your fathers to the undoing of insanity. Faith and belief have shifted and you have asked the question the ego will never ask. Faith and belief upheld by reason cannot fail to lead to changed perception. And in this change is room made way for vision. In summary, section five, the function of reason is saying, reason tells us that we cannot be the bodies we see simply because we know we existed in some way or form before we entered them. We do in fact know on some level that we must be something else. Therefore, 
what was once joined with God must still be there, within us, somewhere. It is not meaningful to ask whether or not this is true. It is only meaningful to ask why we cannot see it. It is because we have chosen another perception, one through the body's eyes, over that of our holy vision, which can see what the body cannot. We now ask the question the ego will never ask. How can we each appear separate from all creation when reason dictates we must each still be a part of it in holy unity? Use reason, then, to strengthen your faith and belief in the truth of our wholeness, and true vision will soon follow. Section 6. Reason versus Madness Reason cannot see sin but can see errors, and leads to their correction. Reason will also tell you that when you think you sin, you call for help. Yet, if you will not accept the help you call for, you will not believe that it is yours to give. For reason would not make way for correction in you alone. Correction cannot be accepted or refused by you without your brother. Sin would maintain you and your brother must be separate, but reason tells you that this must be wrong, for only bodies can be separate, and therefore unreal. The home of madness cannot be the home of reason, yet it is easy to leave the home of madness if you see reason. The body does not separate you from your brother, and if you think it does, you are insane. To see the body as a barrier between what reason tells you must be joined must be insane, nor could you see it if you heard the voice of reason. That you are joined to him is but a fact, not an interpretation. Reason will tell you that this fact is your release. The power to heal the Son of God is given you because he must be one with you, and reason tells you it is given you to change his whole mind, which is one with you, in just an instant. That you and your brother are joined is your salvation, the gift of heaven, not the gift of fear. Spend but an instant in the glad acceptance of what is given you to give your brother, and learn with him what has been given both of you. The Son of God is always blessed as one, and as his gratitude goes out to you who blessed him, reason will tell you that it cannot be you stand apart from blessing. But where he chooses to condemn instead, there is he held a prisoner, waiting in chains his pardon on himself to set him free. In summary, section 6, Reason versus Madness, is saying... Reason tells us that when we think we sin, when we believe we are bodies and likewise react to them, it is actually a call for help. But the caveat then is, we must also accept the help we receive, and such help is always not only just for us, but for everyone, for they are also one with us. When we are healed, we are never healed alone. To see that we are joined is, in fact, our healing. It is the answer to our call for help. Reason will tell us this is our release, given the truth of our oneness. To see this, have faith in it, and believe it, is our salvation from the madness of separation. It is the gift of heaven to see the oneness that is true in heaven here on earth. And where we choose not to see this is to condemn our brethren, and likewise ourselves, to the bondage of the ego. Do not react to the body through your ego. Let reason guide your mind to see only oneness where there appears to be many, and the madness of separation is healed. Section 7. The Last Unanswered Question do you not see that all your misery comes from the strange belief that you are powerless? Being helpless is the cost of sin. 
No one believes the Son of God is powerless, and those who see themselves as helpless must believe they are not the Son of God. What can they be except his enemy? Because they do not know that they are one with him, they know not whom they hate. Frantic and loud and strong the dark ones seem to be, yet they know not their enemy except they hate. And love is turned to hate as easily. How treacherous does this enemy appear, who changes so it is impossible even to recognize him. Yet hate must have a target. Who that believes in sin would dare believe he has no enemy? Could he admit that no one made him powerless? Reason would surely bid him seek no longer what is not there to find. But let him only ask himself these questions, which he must decide to have it done for him. Do I desire a world I rule instead of one that rules me? Do I desire a world where I am powerful instead of helpless? Do I desire a world in which I have no enemies and cannot sin? And do I want to see what I denied because it is the truth? You may already have answered the first three questions, but not yet the last, for this one still seems fearful and unlike the others, yet reason would assure you they are all the same. Consider carefully your answer to the last question you have left unanswered still, and then it will be clear to you that, as you look on the effects of sin in any form, all you need do is simply ask yourself, is this what I would see? Do I want this? This is your one decision. This, the condition for what occurs. It is irrelevant to how it happens, but not to why. You have control of this, and if you choose to see a world without an enemy in which you are not helpless, the means to see it will be given you. Why is the final question so important? reason will tell you why. It is the same as are the other three, except in time. The others are decisions that can be made and then unmade and made again. But truth is constant and implies a state where vacillations are impossible. Yet the last question adds the wish for constancy in your desire to see the real world so the desire becomes the only one you have. By answering the final question, yes, you add sincerity to the decisions you have already made to all the rest, for only then have you renounced the option to change your mind again. No one decides against his happiness, but he may do so if he does not see he does it. Elusive happiness or happiness in changing form that shifts with time and place is an illusion that has no meaning. Happiness must be constant because, because it is attained by giving up the wish for the inconstant. Desire what you want, and you will look on it and think it real. No thought but has the power to release or kill, and none can leave the thinker's mind or leave him unaffected. In summary, section 7, the last unanswered question, is saying, As human bodies, we feel powerless against the whims of the world around us. This is the cost of belief in sin, the belief in our bodily identity, for the body is indeed weak and on the path to death from the moment of its birth. What we do not realize is that if we withdrew this belief and allowed the truth to replace our idea of who we are, we would activate our eternal power to change what we experience. To do this, we have only to answer one question. However, there is just one caveat. We have to believe the answer is true. What is the question? It is but this. Do we desire to see a world not made by the ego, a world we denied because we chose to become a body, an identity we are not? 
And are we then willing to give up this false identity and allow the truth to replace it? Can we see ourselves as eternal beings of love and light instead? Do we really want to see each other in this way? To make this change of mind takes vigilance. And all things you see, you must remember to ask yourself, is this the world I want to see? Answer this last unanswered question, and your world will shift according to what you truly want. Section 8. The Inner Shift Are thoughts, then, dangerous? To bodies, yes. The thoughts that seem to kill are those that teach the thinker that he can be killed, and so he dies because of what he learned. The constancy of joy is a condition quite alien to your understanding. Yet, if you could even imagine what it must be, you would desire it, although you understand it not. It comes as surely unto those who see the final question is necessary to to the rest, as peace must come to those who choose to heal and not to judge. Reason will tell you that you cannot ask for happiness inconstantly, for if what you desire you receive, and happiness is constant, then you need ask for it but once to have it always. And if you do not have it always, being what it is, you did not ask for it. You who complete God's will and are his happiness, whose will is powerful as his, a power that is not lost in your illusions, think carefully why you have not yet decided how you would answer the final question. And yet it is the final one that really asks if you are willing to be wholly sane. What is the holy instant but God's appeal to you to recognize what he has given you? Here is the constant peace you could experience forever. For here, the final question is already answered, and what you ask for, given. For you have asked that nothing stand between the holiness of your relationship and your awareness of its holiness. In summary, section 8, The Inner Shift, is saying, In order to shift your outer world, you must first make an inner shift. This is simply a change of mind about who people are to you in truth. What is your true relationship with them? Are they mother, father, brother, sister, child, partner, stranger, or enemy? All these categories are of the ego, for it loves to analyze, compartmentalize, and decide who is worthy of love and when. Once you make the inner shift to seeing all people as one with you, once you recognize the light that joins us all, your heart will shift and peace will come to all your relationships. The inner shift is merely an acknowledgement of this oneness, and it is this that makes every relationship you have holy. All that is being asked of you is that your only desire be to see nothing standing between yourself and all others, The inner shift is your desire to become aware of the holiness of God within them, he who holds us all as one in his love. Then will God's reason guide your mind at last, and your perception will make a shift into a new world. This concludes Chapter 21, Reason and Perception. Written Narrated and produced by Beth Gear. For more from me, go to www.bethgear.com. And don't forget to like and subscribe. Thank you, and peace be with you.